Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Yes, it's the Skeptic Zone podcast, episode number 776 for the 20th of August, 2023. Richard Saunders coming to you today from Oakland, California. The weather lately has been very warm to hot, well, in parts of the Bay Area anyway, and a bit muggy. Coming up on today's show, you can count on Adrian with Adrian Hill. Adrian chats to Janice Boynton and Susan Gerbeck about the similarities between psychic readings and facilitated communication. Now, I must admit the similarities didn't instantly spring to my mind, but I think you'll find this segment very interesting. As skeptics, we certainly have an interest in psychic reading and facilitated communication. Following that, it's a bizarre story about a once famous, well, notorious, still a bit famous, around the edges, Israeli magician. And his uh, tweet, or X, as they call it these days, about dead aliens. Dead aliens, yeah. Looking suspiciously like a prop from a TV show. Find out more. Following that, Susan Gerbeck returns and chats with Kenny Biddle. And Kenny Biddle was a guest on the show just last week. Kenny and Susan are up in the state of Oregon, where I will be in a couple of weeks, for Kenny to give some lectures about critical thinking. And uh, Kenny's lecture, as you'll discover, is uh, very interesting, and it's something I... I should attend one day myself. Then we have some news from the Center for Inquiry about their ongoing fight against homeopathy being sold in pharmacies and department stores. And this time they're requesting that their U.S. listeners take some real action by contacting their member of Congress. Political help, maybe. Find out more when we look at the news from the Center for Inquiry. Then to round off the show in the Trove segment... We look at references in Australian newspapers to chiropractic. Chiropractic. Yes, it's back again. Now, a quick correction from last week's episode. A minor correction. During the segment with Kenny Biddle about uh, electronic voice phenomena, voices of ghosts on radio, I discuss briefly the brainstorm green needle illusion, audio illusion, However, I referred to it as the brain freeze green needle. Just to be clear, I got that wrong. It's actually brain storm green needle. And to refresh your memory, here it is again. Just think the words brainstorm. Now think the words Green needle. And speaking of our segment with uh, Kenny Biddle from last week, and it was interesting to hear how various people heard various uh, words from the same clip from the Ghost Box Radio, you will recall. Well, Adrian Hill has chimed in and said, She, in sample one from last week, she heard noises, just noises. The same with sample two. In sample three from last week, she heard the word hello. And in sample four and five, she only heard noises. Although it's interesting, after hearing the answers from other people, she was then primed and could hear different words, which is a classic uh, part of audio pareidolia. Also, my friend Kat Mack up in Canada. Hi. In clips one and two, she heard nothing specific. In clip three, she heard extra Coke. Extra Coke, not Diet Coke, but extra Coke. In clip four, she heard just noise. And in clip five, she heard the word freaky. Upon replaying in clip one, she heard the word good. Now, if you go back to last week's episode and you hear different things, Why not head to the Facebook page of The Skeptic Zone and uh, make a comment? What did you hear in the various clips? 
Now, before we get really stuck into this week's show, a big thank you to everybody who turned up at the Berkeley Public Library last weekend to see my workshop, The Skeptical Box of Tricks. We had something like 30 people show up, all bending spoons. Bend, put those poor spoons. And uh, learning about water divining and power balance tricks. And everybody made some origami at the end of the day. I look forward to giving the same lecture up in, or the same workshop, I should say, up in Bend, Oregon, on the night of the 29th of this month. Head to skepticzone.tv for more details. But now it's time for me to run around the corner and find some Vietnamese pho. Mmm, yum, yum, yum. Very nice sort of uh, noodle soup. While I do that, I hope you enjoy The Skeptic Zone. You can count on Adrian with Adrian Hill. Hello everyone, this is Adrian Hill from Skookum Studios in Calgary. I'm here talking with my good friends Susan Gervick and Janice Boynton. And they both invited me recently to participate in reviewing videos about psychics and facilitated communication, or FC. And these two topics, it turns out, have a little more in common than I thought they might have. Let's talk first about Psychic Susan. Tell us why you invited Janice and me to be involved with these psychic videos. I have a channel called Psychics Explained, or as I'm starting to call it, Psychic Sex Explained. We evaluate, well, what I do on this channel is I take readings and I take audio or video readings of psychics that have been done and I break it down into chunks and explain and we evaluate. And a lot of the times I'm just doing it by myself. And so I had decided recently to invite Janice and you yourself, Adrian, to my channel and we've recorded some videos and it's a lot of fun. It really is. It's a lot of fun. You guys offer insight into this that I had not seen. Little bits and things that you picked up that I didn't pick up or, you know, vice versa. You guys are good critical thinkers. You have a lot of experience in the world of pseudoscience, not necessarily in psychics. Really interesting to see your take on it and for you guys to hear my thoughts on how it works. Like we don't always agree. The last one we did I believed it was almost all cold reading. And you guys kept thinking there's a lot more hot reading in this. I'm like, no, those are just tropes done by cold readers. You're like, no, but it seems so specific. And then that was the interesting part is how much you guys thought it was specific when I'm saying, no, that's cold reading. Because that's what a sitter would see. They would think of it the same way. Wow, I had a really specific reading when in fact, they just had a cold reading. So I had you guys on. It provides all sorts of interesting discussions and laughter, and it makes it less tedious for me. So I'm really enjoying having you guys fill in once in a while to take over some of my uh, research. The problem, if it's a problem, I don't know if it's a problem, but we seem to be a little long-winded. You know, we, we evaluate a 10-minute reading, and it takes us two and a half hours to get through, which is part of the problem with investigating any kind of claim of the paranormal. From what I understand, it takes so much work to explain something and it just takes no time at all for the phenomenon or whatever it is, the pseudoscience. They, they say this amazing thing and they're done in like five seconds and then we have to spend an hour to break it down into chunks and explain how it works. But anyway, that's what we're doing on Psychic Sex Planed. And I think one of the things we found really interesting, too, were the comments from the people watching. They were all also catching things that we three would miss. And Janice, we met a few years ago because of our connection with Susan. Can you explain a little bit? I think most people know what psychics are, but can you explain a little bit about facilitated communication or FC, why you were involved and why you asked Susan and me along to view an FC video just today? Okay. Well, facilitated communication is a technique that's being used with individuals with profound autism, usually other disabilities as well, 
but it's a build as a communication technique that allows them to tap into their inner thoughts, uh, like they're trapped inside of their autistic world. And just by providing emotional or physical support, they can touch a letter board and spell out all these amazing messages. I was a facilitator in the early 1990s when facilitated communication first hit the United States through Douglas Bicklin at Syracuse University. I was trained actually in the University of Maine with someone who had trained under Douglas Bicklin. My story is that there were false allegations of abuse brought against the client. I had to go through double blind testing to test authorship. And it turns out I was authoring those messages and I didn't realize at the time. So it opened up a whole world of, you know, how self-delusion and motivated reasoning can, even if you're well-intentioned, can lead you down a pretty dark path. And um, I've been really fortunate, like I've met Susan, I've been, met a lot of experts around the world that have sort of helped me unlock or unpack some of the psychological components of facilitated communication. I kind of see it as a coping strategy now and not as a communication technique. And in talking to Susan and you, I have kind of realized that there's a lot of commonalities between the psychic world and the facilitated world where people are really wanting to, In the as a psychic, you want to, to communicate with a lost loved one um, through death. And I think with facilitated communication, you still want to communicate with a lost loved one, but it's through a disability. And what a heartbreak that is for some parents to deal with. In the show notes that um, Richard is going to put under this in this podcast, we're going to put this article that is written by Stuart Weiss about Janice's experience for Skeptical Inquirer. It's called An Artist with a Science-Based Mission. And this breaks down her story. And it is powerful, and um, we're just really honored to have Janice within our community, the skeptic community, because when I met her years ago, I didn't know about her her journey. I thought facilitated communication was debunked because James Brandy had, you know, talked about it, and there had been some big specials on TV that it's obviously nonsense. I hadn't heard of it, so to have Janice come to the forefront, she's not a ham I guess, like I am, and maybe like Adrian is here. So she's had to step into the limelight somewhat. And it's not a, how should I say, comfortable place to be when, you know, I know exactly how uncomfortable this could be. But because of the situation that Janice was in, she was once a, a facilitator herself. And then to have been tested, which was, oh my gosh, you're not ever going to be tested. She was tested and, and she um, realized that what was going on. You guys read all about Janice's story, and it's powerful. Awesome. And there's also, I believe, an Australian connection. I blame the Australians. It's all there. Yes. I actually got an apology from an Australian who actually spoke out really early on. But what happened when facilitated communication first came onto the scene, and it's still happening now because it's it's having a resurgence, it's, it's been renamed. And so I'm like the those of us who have been watching facilitated communication for a really long time are like, ah, we're back in the 1990s, starting all over again. <laughs> but anyway, they what happened was that the people who saw that it was not viable as a communication technique, a lot of them just said it's just a fad. It's gonna it's gonna fade away. And um, some of them spoke out, but not enough to keep it. Fr and, and it just took off in a way that nobody really expected. And uh, we're still dealing with that today. Yes. But I got an apology from somebody from Australia. The last thing I would like to talk about is something that comes up in both the psychic and the facilitated communication world. What's the harm? What is the harm? And I think the harms are very common between the two as well. It gives false hope to parents. It's a lie. It's expensive. And I'm talking about both worlds, facilitated communication and the psychic medium world. It's wrong. People are in need of help and they're turning to something that is pseudoscience that they should get real help in the world of the psychic mediums. They should be getting grief counseling from somebody licensed, not some grief vampire somewhere who's just preying on them for the money and for the praise 
endorsements. It's just wrong. And it pisses me off. Yeah, Susan was getting rather angry today in the... It, it's really it's annoying. They're not even looking at the freaking board. What's wrong with these people? Do you have anything to add to that, Janice? I think she covered a lot of it, but do you have anything more? Yeah, uh, it prevents people from seeing the the child, or it's not always children, but the person with disabilities for who they are. And what happens is that the facilitator puts their own thoughts and feelings onto the child instead of seeing them for who they are. I've seen people are only accepted, people with severe communication disabilities are only accepted once they start express, quote unquote, and expressing their ideas through facilitated communication. So until they're saying that they, I love mom, I love dad, or they're going to college or writing poetry or whatever it is that they're doing, that's when people start paying attention to them and validating them. And it's it's all based on false hope, in my opinion. Well, and research shows that as well. But and science is opinion. <laughs> Everybody yeah. who has a well, common sense to look <laughs> Very rarely say 100% about anything, but all of the controlled studies, if they're reliably controlled, 100% of the time, it's the facilitators and not the person with disabilities. So sad on so many levels that it's still permeating. And you said too, Janice, that this is worldwide too. This is not just something that is in Australia. Can I don't know if it's in Canada. It is in Canada. Yeah, um, it's it's world it's worldwide. And there are a lot of times that it happens under the radar. It's That's a purposeful thing. So people, I hear quite a bit, oh, it's not in Europe. And it's like, but yes, it is. You know, so, uh, we have stories and accounts, proponent accounts that they're in everywhere, <laughs> every country. They change um, the name. And they do change the name, yeah. What's The one that we watched today was called a rapid prompting method. Is that right? Yes. That's outdated. Spelling to communicate. <laughs> Hand over hand. Communication for education is one of the newest ones. Motor communication therapy. I mean, I've got a website or we've got a website called um, facilitatedcommunication.org. And there's a lot of information about FC there, including on the front page, there's a list, uh, an an ever-growing list of what facilitated communication is called. Thanks so much. And thanks for giving the website. Uh, Susan, how can people contact you? Janice and I both have separate YouTube accounts. We would love to have you reach out and subscribe. They're independent of each other, but they tend to be both about the same kind of things, breaking down what we're finding in YouTube videos or audio recordings from the world of the psychic, psychic medium. I mainly focus on mediumship, people who claim to be able to communicate with the dead. And Janice is finding these videos about facilitated communication or whatever it's called at the moment. And what we're able to do is we're able to break them down into chunks for people to really understand what they're seeing. And it's wonderful. It's tedious, but I think it needs to be done. And my channel is called Psychics Explained, or as we said, Psychic Sex Plained. And Janice (laughs) is... And Janice's YouTube channel is called FC is not science with no spaces. It's all FC is not science. And Richard will make sure to put those two YouTube video links in the show notes. Thank you so much for joining me, Susan and Janice. Thank you so much. I hope we're going to be able to work together on a lot more adventures in the future because we've got a lot to do. There's a lot of people to educate out there. And I know those Skeptic Zone listeners love that kind of stuff. They're up to date on what's happening. What's happening? You're so good off the cuff there, Susan. Well, thanks so much for joining me, ladies. And we'll talk again soon. Until next time, this is Adrian Hill. strange story that's come my way over the last couple of days. It's to do with a certain Israeli magician. Oh yes, none other than Uri Geller. 
or Yuri Geller, depending on how you pronounce it. A real character from the past who keeps trying to make himself relevant today. And while it's easy to dismiss his claims in this day and age, there are still many, many people who follow him and uh, believe his claims of magical, truly magical, as in supernatural, mystical powers. And he's made more headlines lately. Here's a story as published at GamingBible.com and it says Yuri Geller shares proof aliens exists. Fans quickly point out that it's a photo from the X-Files. And this is a story by Kate Harold, published on the 15th of August, 2023. But first, I think we should read the tweet from Yuri Geller himself, which is from the 14th of August. And this is from at the Yuri Geller. My dear friends, I cannot at this stage reveal any information about this photo, but please be patient until I'm allowed to say more, if at all. And that, of course, is harking back to when he said he was gagged by various shadowy figures. We read on. Meanwhile, I am very curious what you all think about this picture. You might notice something I have overlooked. Remember, I have seen alien bodies in a NASA refrigerator room with Dr. Werner von Braun and Captain Edgar Mitchell who walked on the moon. There was a CIA scientist with us. Hashtag alien. Hashtag aliens. Hashtag UAP. Hashtag UFO. Hashtag NASA. Now getting back to the story at Gaming Bible, Kate Harold says... Before we begin, I want you to know that I just let out an audible sigh. Yuri Geller has taken to Twitter in an attempt to show a photo that proves that aliens exist. As it turns out, it's a photo taken from the TV show The X-Files. Now she briefly mentions the latest UFO kerfuffle with David Grush at Congress. And then she goes on to say Yuri Geller has joined in on the debate. If you don't know, Geller is an illusionist and self-proclaimed psychic. He previously came under fire from fellow illusionists who say that claiming to actually have psychic powers is fraud. Geller claims his powers were gifted by extraterrestrials, despite the fact that his tricks can be replicated using stage magic techniques. Geller attests that he was sent to Earth by aliens from a spaceship 53,000 light years away. It was only a matter of time before Geller threw his two cents into the latest alien situation. Taking to Twitter, Geller shared a photo showing alien corpses lined up in a morgue. And then she goes on to quote the tweet, or the X. Appropriate, really. X files, X. And then she says, it turns out there is really nothing to reveal about the photo. It was soon tagged as being from Season 5, Episode 1 of The X-Files. Proof equals debunked. And not one to shy away from publicity, Geller has chimed in. As reported at The Daily Star by Lee McManus on the 16th of August. Yuri Geller hits back over claims he stole proof of aliens pick from The X-Files. World famous spoon bender Yuri Geller has hit back at skeptics who said a photo he used as proof aliens exist is actually from a very well known show about extraterrestrials. Goes on to say the spoon bender recently took to X, formerly Twitter, and shared a photo showing alien corpses lined up in a morgue. He claimed he had inside knowledge of their existence. He reminded people in the tweet on Monday, August 14. That, quote, I have seen alien bodies in a NASA refrigerator room, end quote. But even X's, as in Twitter's, even Twitter's, now known X, community notes attest that the image was from series 
5, episode 1 of the show. Earlier today, he responded to his, quote, dear skeptics, end quote, writing, quote, some of you had a problem with this photo I posted because you claimed it came from the X-Files series. I don't see any similarity to the morgue body trolleys nor to the bodies on them from the X-Files series. If you read my message, which was posted with the photo, I make it very clear that I want your opinion. End quote. He then reminded people that, quote, Dr. Werner von Braun showed me, showed in capitals, alien bodies, end quote, that were somewhat similar to those in the photo. Werner von Braun was a major in the SS, but his passion laid in his dream of space travel, saying in 1936, we will fly to the moon. Geller repeated his claims about the refrigerator room and said it was in a well-known NASA base. Quote, when we went inside, it smelled like a hospital. I could see what looked like heavy glass containers with lifeless bodies lying inside them, end quote. He recalled, quote, it was a shocking sight, like when you see an accident that has happened and you feel like something has hit you in the stomach. The containers looked like thick, triple glazed, transparent coffins that were misted with frost along the edges and corners. The bodies inside were small, thin, and very frail-looking, but they were disturbingly familiar, end quote. He said the almost human-like bodies were, quote, severely injured, or they had decomposed a lot, despite being kept so cold. None of your cynical and skeptical scoffing comments will change what I have seen, end quote. He added, He went on to say that if the photo is actually from the X-Files, then the producers have probably, quote, received undercover input from real government agencies, end quote, about how aliens look. It seems to me no matter what this man says, he will make it into the press one way or another, which is exactly what he loves to do. Now, I'm quite thrilled every now and then when I make it into the press. I've been in the press just recently in Australia, and it's nice. It's it's okay, and I hope it furthers the cause of science and reason. But it's not uncommon for Yuri Geller to um, make some sort of comment about anything going on which is vaguely paranormal, or that he can take credit for. For example, 23 years ago during the Summer Olympics in Sydney, the torch got stuck, the, the giant cauldron after the Olympic flame was lit, was ascending to the top of the stadium and it sort of got stuck halfway for a minute or two. And uh, I think Geller claimed that he used his mystical powers to uh, to release it and uh, saved the day. So now we discover he's actually seen alien bodies in refrigerators at NASA with Werner von Braun and Edgar Mitchell. Sounds like the punchline for a joke, doesn't it? And just trawling through a search on... The internet on news about Yuri Geller. Lately, we have Yuri Geller shares UFO video claiming aliens are watching us. That's disconcerting. Something from the Jerusalem Post. The life of Israeli psychic Yuri Geller explored in new documentary. Another headline, Yuri Geller, I made a fortune bending spoons. Now I live in a tiny apartment with IKEA furniture. And... Not long ago, the New York Times published a piece which has been widely criticized by leading skeptics, and the piece was called The End of the Magic World's 50-Year Grudge, more or less claiming that magicians say everything's okay and they're siding with Geller. Nothing could be further from the truth. What will the man come up with next? Undoubtedly something, the next psychic or paranormal story, and I'm sure he'll have a comment to make on X, as in The X-Files. Hi. 
Hello, this is Maynard. Did you know that you can listen to The Skeptic Zone on YouTube? Yes, I know, sounds crazy, but it's true. Also, you can hear 40 Logical Fallacies with Michelle Bickersma and Funny Sketches with Richard Saunders and a host of other skeptics. Just click on the YouTube links on the homepage at skepticzone.tv. you may remember that over the past few years we've been covering the story of the Centre for Inquiry taking legal action to stop homeopathy being sold in such places as CVS pharmacies and Walmart in the United States. And this alert came to me this week and I thought because we're following this story it's worth talking about even though this is very US centric. Centre for Inquiry tell your representative in Congress to reject pro-homeopathy amendment. CFI, Centre for Inquiry, calls on our supporters to help defeat a pro-homeopathy amendment being proposed for the Federal Appropriations Bill, HR 4368. The homeopathy lobby is pushing hard for this amendment, and we need CFI supporters to voice their opposition to their members of Congress. Homeopathy groups such as Americans for Homeopathy Choice, AFHC, are lobbying strenuously for Appropriations Amendment No. 4. This amendment would bar FDA enforcement of the food, drug and cosmetic law against new homeopathic drug products as long as a product complies with, quote, standards for strength, quality and purity set forth in the homeopathic pharmacopoeia of the United States, end quote. In other words, it would replace much-needed federal regulation with the industry's own standards. And we know from history how good self-regulation is. CFI has consistently pointed out that homeopathy is bunk science that does not work beyond the placebo effect. Homeopathic products are typically diluted to the point that no active ingredients remain. It is quack medicine and consumer fraud. The homeopathic pharmacopoeia standards of quality are not medically valid. Yet the amendment would exempt homeopathic products from FDA regulation and oversight if they comport with those standards. This amounts to an argument of, quote, no need for federal regulation, we can regulate ourselves with our own standards, even if they constitute medical fraud, end quote. Or, more succinctly, quote, let the fox guard the hen house, please, end quote. Indeed, Center for Inquiry has tussled with the homeopathic pharmacopoeia before, and that uh, provides a link. At the moment, AFHC and the homeopathy lobby are seeking additional sponsors in the House of Representatives for their amendment. This is where CFI supporters come in. I just stop here and say that maybe if the homeopathic lobby wants stronger representation, they should decrease their representation in line with homeopathic principles. Hmm. We need our supporters to mobilize and contact their members in the House of Representatives immediately. Please let them know in no uncertain terms that homeopathy cannot and must not escape federal regulation. It is crucial to keep Appropriations Amendment Number 4 out of the Federal Appropriations Bill. And that's signed Azam Majid, Director of Government Affairs. Now, if you're in the United States and you want to take action, as requested by the Center for Inquiry, I will link to this page in this week's show notes. But this reminds me of the time that the skeptical community took on those power balance bracelets all those years ago, although we could demonstrate that they didn't work, which I uh, was able to do on national TV a long time ago. When it really came to the crunch, it required government action to really put the boot in. And we hope this is just another step into seeing homeopathy consigned to the bad ideas bin of history. Okay. 
Okay, zebras, uh, orangutans. Oh, yes, sorry. Hi. I'm not used to the animals talking. Uh, Who are you? Yes, my name is Carrie Poppy. I co host a podcast called Owner Ross and Carrie. This is my co host Ross right here. Okay. We investigate spirituality, claims of the paranormal. And we were wondering if we could get on the ark. You did come two by two. I Thank appreciate you. that. Though most of the things I'm letting on the ark don't talk. I'm going to be talking all up on this boat. Do you mind both? I prefer ark. Or okay, barge. I'm not listening, but. If you let me on, mm -hmm. then I will make my really good podcast on your boat. Can you barge. at least help clean up all the poop? I guess I don't see why not. Well, I'll check out the podcast. Where do I find it? It's on MaximumFun.org. think we need to think. Here's Susan Gerbic. Hello, Skeptic Zone listeners. This is Susan Gerbic from the Grill of Skepticism on Wikipedia Project. I am here in Portland, Oregon with a dear friend of mine, Kenny Biddle. We're on a, like a mini tour. He was in, uh, gave a talk in Seattle the other day, which was really popular to the Seattle skeptics. It was a lot of fun. And now we're in Portland, Oregon, and we just visited Powell Books and we all came out unscathed and we managed to come out with just one bag of books. So if you don't know what Powell's Books is, you guys gotta look it up. But Kenny, what are you gonna be talking about tonight? I'm gonna be talking about strategies for solving mysteries. Basically, over the years, I've put together a list of little cheat sheets, pretty much. They're, they're, they're cheaters so that I can figure out how best to solve a mystery. And if I get stuck, I can look up at a, a graphic poster that I created with all the strategies on, strategies on it and then see what I haven't thought of yet. And some of them, there's 24 on the, the list. And I'm going to go over about 12 or 13 of them tonight. Wonderful. You are here on a mini tour with Eric Schaefer from the Center for Inquiry. And you guys are kind of on a little bit of a you know, Center for Inquiry, introducing everybody to who Kenny Biddle is. Can you say, well, besides from what you just said about what to talk is tonight, can you tell us a little bit about your, your job at the Center for Inquiry? So I am the chief investigator, and that means that I investigate all the weird stuff that goes on from haunted houses to alien visitation to monsters and stuff like that. It's, it's an amazing job. I get to research and learn new things all day. I get to, not, not only that, I, I solve the mysteries, I write about them, I create videos about them for CSI and CFI, but I also get to develop classes and lectures and talks about critical thinking and teach these skills to uh, not just adults, but kids alike, because I get to zoom into classrooms and talk to kids about how to look at mysteries, how to look at things from a more scientific and skeptical point of view. And it gives them the skills to figure out what's real, what's not real, and what they should believe or not believe. In a fun way. In a fun way, yes. Absolutely. So Eric Schaefer and I are more or less really on a mission to get the groups back together in worldwide because the pandemic really hit a lot of the groups hard. And we're really trying to get the, the local groups to uh, become communities again, meeting in person. So um, one of the things that we have is a website. It's centerforinquiry.org. And you can look in there under group resources. If you're looking for a group, you can look on the map and you can find places that might be meeting around you. And if so, how to get a hold of them. Or if there is no group located near you, hey, why don't you reach out to the Center for Inquiry org, and they'll help you get a group started. So I'm really looking forward to your talk tonight, Kenny. And um, thanks so much for allowing me to come along on this adventure with you. You are most welcome. And honestly, if you didn't get here, we would not get anywhere because you're the driver. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I'm the driver. Thanks, Kenny. It's 
time once again to go back to those pages at trove at trove.nla.gov.au, the online resource from the Australian Government and the National Library of Australia. And we look for things relating to sceptical topics. It's a pretty, pretty, uh, what's the word, uh, the expression, a wide net. We do cast a wide net. And this week we're going to be looking at uh, alternative health, specifically mentions of chiropractors and chiropractic. And Wikipedia says about chiropractic, chiropractic is a form of alternative medicine concerned with the diagnosis, treatment and prevention of mechanical disorders of the musculoskeletal system, especially of the spine. It has esoteric origins and is based on several pseudoscientific ideas. It goes on to say systematic reviews and controlled clinical studies of treatments used by chiropractors have found no evidence that chiropractic manipulation is effective, with the possible exception of treatment for back pain. And of course, claims of chiropractic have long been in the sights for skeptics around the world. But now let's have a look see what references we can find in Australian newspapers and such like, and we turn to the Canberra Times, dated the 11th of July, 1973. Delay likely. Australian Capital Territory, or ACT, moves for chiropractors by Susan van der Heuvel, health reporter. ACT Health Services have received several requests for registration of chiropractors in the ACT, but will wait until it gets some of the, quote, more urgent matters, end quote, out of the way before making a submission to the Minister for Health. Approaches for the registration have been made by doctors, physiotherapists and patients of chiropractors, but as yet no direct approach has been made by the seven chiropractors working in Canberra. And you can bet your bottom dollar there's a lot more than seven chiropractors working in Canberra now. It is believed they are waiting on the results of similar moves in New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland. The government of these three states have set up committees to examine registration of chiropractors. Chiropractors have been registered in Western Australia since 1965. The director of the ACT Health Services, Dr Ronald Wells, said last week that the approaches had been made on the basis of protecting patients and train chiropractors from unskilled people and ensuring high standards. Steps were already in progress for amendments to the health legislation covering the ACT, but chiropractors were well down on the priority list. More urgent matters included amendments to the registration of doctors, nurses, optometrists and pharmacists, and to the sale of drugs. When these had been dealt with, a submission on chiropractors would be made to the minister. Although Canberra chiropractors seem to be playing a waiting game, they are in fact very keen for registration to protect themselves and their patients from charlatans. I wonder what charlatans they were thinking about. But even among the chiropractors in Canberra, there seems to be some doubt as to who is properly qualified. Four of the chiropractors are members of the Australian Chiropractors Association, all of whose members have graduated from one of eight recognized colleges in the USA, Canada, or Great Britain. Two chiropractors who also practice osteopathy and naturopathy are members of the Australian Chiropractors, Osteopaths and Naturopathic Physicians Association Limited. One of these men trained at Sydney College of Osteopathy and Naturopathy and the other trained with a private practitioner in Sydney. The seventh chiropractor could not be reached for comment. The, quotes, legitimate, end quotes, chiropractor, according to the ACA, deals only with the analysis of interference with normal nerve transmission and the correction of this by adjustments to the vertical column without the use of drugs or surgery. Members of both associations are willing to refer patients to doctors when they are unable to treat a problem. And in some cases, doctors refer patients to chiropractors, even though it is against the policy of the Australian Medical Association. But most doctors continue to be sceptical of chiropractors and will not work with them because they are not registered. Few doctors will support registration moves. In June, 
ACT Health Services stopped physiotherapy treatment for a six-year-old spastic girl because she was also undergoing chiropractic treatment. The mother decided to forego the physiotherapy and continue the chiropractic treatment. Sort of a little bit early days in Australia for chiropractic. When was that? That was 1973. And now we go forward to the year 1988 in the Canberra Times once again on the 9th of November. Medical Course, A Risk to Public by Karen Hobson. A three days doctor's workshop on back pain and spinal manipulation has raised concerns of the ACT branch of the Australian Chiropractors Association. The course has been held in six cities and begins in Canberra on Friday. It is being conducted under the auspices of the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners. The president of the ACTACA, and I think that's the Australian Capital Territory, uh, Australian Chiropractors Association, I would imagine, Dr. Thomas Smith said in a statement that it could be considered ironically amusing that the medical profession should endorse the seminars having been for, quote, so long sceptical and critical of the chiropractic profession. However, these courses present very serious concerns in terms of potential patient injury. Mm. How anyone could consider it possible to adequately instruct persons in an area requiring precise technical appreciation and highly developed manual dexterity through a three-day course is quite beyond comprehension. He said, accredited programs in chiropractic were five-year courses. However, one of the course leaders, Dr. John Murtart, I think it's pronounced, said from Melbourne on Monday that the chiropractors had been making similar claims since the courses began four years ago. Doctors have been practicing physical therapy for many years. This is nothing new, he said. It is provided for doctors with a minimum of eight years training, including two years postgraduate and doctors with a specific interest in physical therapy. The main reason for setting up the course was to help doctors in isolated areas who might not have the support of physiotherapists or other practitioners. The course was an introductory one, which concentrated on, quote, very simple and safe, end quote, mobilization techniques, back pain, diagnosis and physical examination, and which was supplemented by notes and ongoing workshops. While it did cover some basic manipulation techniques, this was covered more extensively in advanced courses. Dr. Smith said such short courses, whether they included extensive workshop sessions or not, presented a serious risk to public safety, with the possibility of the patient being subjected to a treatment performed by a person with unacceptable standards of training. Oh, the irony. Oh, on the same page, there's an ad for some alcohol here. What's this? Champagne for $3.99 a bottle. And once again, the Canberra Times, this time dated the 22nd of May, 1995. Health careers still at war. Chiropractors today are launching their latest bid for community acceptance, but the medical mainstream remains sceptical. Jacqueline Fuller reports. Chiropractors have for decades been besieged in the healthcare industry, persecuted and portrayed by medical professionals as unscientific quacks. The unrelenting denigration has flowed over to patients, who chiropractors say are significantly discriminated against in that there is no provision for rebate of chiropractic fees under the Medicare system. This is despite the fact that the nation's 2,000 chiropractors, there are almost 25 in the ACT, must be registered primary health care providers under legislation introduced in 1985. But dismissing the prejudice as ignorant or biased, the group is arming itself with scientific validation today to claim its rightful position in the mainstream health care system. And rightful is in quotations. The arsenal includes the findings of the Australian and international studies that spinal manipulation and non-prescriptive medications are the most effective treatments for back pain. However, it is unlikely that the new, confident image of specialists in spinal care, preventative health care and natural health care will be met by the medical body with any 
semblance of acceptance. The National Peak Medical Bodies Policy Statement says, quote, The Australian Medical Association does not recognize any exclusive dogma, such as homeopathy, osteopathy, chiropractic, or naturopathy, or any other practices which are not based on sound scientific principles, end quote. The statement also outlines opposition to the, quote, misleading, end quote, use of the title doctor by chiropractors unless they possess a recognized doctorate or use the honorary title in association with the words, quote, chiropractic, end quote, or, quote, chiropractor, end quote. While the AMA readily accepts that spinal manipulation has a place in the treatment of spinal disease, after accurate diagnosis, it says the therapy should only be performed by a medical practitioner or physiotherapist. An AMA paper, Chiropractic in Australia, 1992, says, quote, Chiropractic manipulation is unsafe when its practitioners extend spinal manipulation beyond safe limits and when it is performed inappropriately. Such manipulation has been linked with a number of severe complications, including sudden death and stroke, end quote. According to the paper, branded by chiropractors as cynical, hypocritical, and an outrageous and unprovoked attack on the integrity of another health profession, spinal manipulation is not the full chiropractic story. In the eyes of many, chiropractic has still not shaken the 100-year-old ideology of its Canadian founder, Dr. Daniel Palmer, that suggested all illnesses were due to spinal disorders. Critics such as the Federal Secretary of the Australian Orthopaedic Association, Brett Courtney, contended that chiropractors have little or no formal training on the diagnosis of disorders. This, Dr. Courtney says, has led to spinal manipulation being dangerously applied by chiropractors to people with undiagnosed maladies such as broken vertebrae, cancer of the spine, and stomach ulcers. The criticisms can be traced back to the beginning of chiropractic in 1895 when the practice's first patient was said to be cured of deafness. The national president of the Chiropractors Association of Australia, Robert Scott, says that while it has been an extremely controversial claim, 10 more cases of deafness cured by chiropractic have been identified in the last 100 years. Uh-huh. But he concedes that 10 cases in 100 years hardly establish chiropractic as a cure for deafness, and it would seem the patients were probably cured by default, or fluke. Now, in chiropractic centenary, practitioners are moving away from making claims that they can cure any organic disease without the support of substantial scientific evidence. Chiropractors say the impact of the tactics of the highly organized, entrenched, and influential AMA is waning. An independent survey late last year shows consumers are not interested in fights between healthcare professionals. Hailed as welcome news and support for their profession, the survey by healthcare advertising agency Sutler & Hennessy via Danga Research found that more than two in three Australians regarded chiropractors as mainstream healthcare providers. Australian chiropractors have written to the Federal Minister for Health, Carmen Lawrence, asking her to review the studies and to recognise chiropractic as a major player in the provision of health care to Australians. In somewhat of a coup for chiropractors, an initiative outlined in the 1995-1996 federal budget will give entitled veterans and war widows and widowers access to chiropractic and osteopathic services for musculoskeletal disorders at the expense of the Department of Veterans Affairs. The Local Medical Officers Advisory Committee has indicated that local medical officers would be happy with veteran access to chiropractic and osteopathic treatment given the safeguard of referral. Despite the concession, Dr. Scott says it is now almost a decade since the Medical Benefits Review Committee, 1986, recommended that chiropractors be appointed to public hospitals, public health centres and clinics. 
He believes it is time for the authorities to grasp the issue, to stand up to the parochial bullying from medical interest groups, and to elevate chiropractic to its proper position in the healthcare system in Australia. Chiropractors will be seeking discussions with Dr. Lawrence to persuade her to bring government policy into line with community expectations and with irrefutable scientific research. A former Canberra consultant surgeon, Arnold Mann, says that if chiropractic has, as it now claims, shed its past and can prove its theories and hypotheses on the same basis as new therapies and orthodox medicine, it will find that its therapies become incorporated into orthodoxy. I remain to be convinced that chiropractic has attained that position as yet, Dr. Mann said. In the view of many experts, including Dr. Mann, chiropractic will, in due course, split into two divisions, one branch allying itself with doctors of physical medicine and physiotherapists, and the other continuing along less orthodox roads. They say patients can choose, and so long as each is judged by the same standard, they will eventually seek services from the correct healthcare provider. But if patients become believers, they could pay dearly. So that was way back in 1995. So almost 30 years later, and much of chiropractic, of course, has uh, yet to, to prove its case. So there we are, looking to only a few of the stories regarding chiropractic. You can imagine there are hundreds in the pages of Australian newspapers going back over the decades. But you can uh, discover those for yourself by visiting trove at trove.nla.gov.au. Type in chiropractic or anything else because you never know what you might find. Thank you for listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. And thank you to all those people who support the Skeptic Zone podcast at skepticzone.tv via Patreon or PayPal. I thank you every episode because you are worthy of thanks. Without you, there would be no Skeptic Zone for me to thank you, if you follow my logic. Coming up on next week's show in the Trove segment, we dive right back to ancient Egypt and look at references in Australian newspapers to Egyptian curses, a fascinating area of research. But for this week, this is Richard Saunders signing off from Oakland, California. You've been listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. Please visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for episodes and show notes with links going back to 2008. You can follow The Skeptic Zone on Facebook, X, formerly known as Twitter, TikTok, and YouTube by clicking the links on our homepage, together with links to support the show financially via Patreon or PayPal. The Skeptic Zone is an independent production. The views and opinions expressed by our guests are not necessarily theirs, or those of The Skeptic Zone podcast, or anyone, really. So get off our back. Yeah, get off our case. Stop hassling us. Stop atting us on Twitter, but just leave us alone, okay? We've got an opinion. Ugh. To you. What? You live off residuals at that point, right? <laughs> I beg in the streets, it's all right. Folks, I'm here in Berkeley, California. And we just had the Skeptical Workshop. Hello, Eugenie Scott. Hello, everybody. Uh, I demonstrated spoon bending. All the people here at the table, we're at a restaurant now, can all bend spoons. They can all find water with divining rods. They can. They can. can. It's amazing. And what else can they do? They can make origami. (laughs) Oh, and they know how to test power balance. Yes. (laughs) Your origami didn't come out so well? Oh, well. I'll have to come back and do it again. But uh, I hope everybody enjoyed the show. I, I enjoyed speaking to everybody. It was a lot of fun. 
And as part of the, uh, the workshop, I gave everybody a 10-sided die, which is very appropriate because this is the bit of the show where we do the psychic test. I'm going to roll this 10-sided die three times, and it's up to everybody here at the table and you at home to use your psychic predicting power or dumb luck. <laughs> Just counting, counting, just counting. You're counting how many people are here? There's nine oh, people. Nine people here. Counting you. Counting me. Uh, and guess what number's going to come up? So, can I hear an offer? What, what do I hear? Four, two, two, four, five, three, five, one. seven, seven, obviously. seven, eight. eight, says Jeannie Scott. Here we go. The first number this week is nine. Did Nobody anybody say Nine. nine? <laughs> no. Not very psychic at this table, are we? No, okay. Oh, okay, okay, hey. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay? That's those are our numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. We'll see if it's nine again. And Wait a minute. No, there's something. Wait special. a minute, here we go. One. It fell off the table. Hang on. He rigged it. It fell off the table again. Nine! Wow! Okay, okay, I, I'm a believer now. I kid you not. It, look, I'm showing everybody at the table. Who was nine? Was I nine? Nobody was nine. Nobody was nine. We better do it again. Okay, nine, okay, nine. Let's throw the, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The nine and the six. If you, if you put it in people's heads, you could get away with it. You could, but it's got a little dot on it. Here, okay, here we go. Last one. Do you think it'll be nine? If it's nine. One. Oh, okay. it's, oh, it's one. Mark, it's you. I got the prize. You got the prize. Well done. <laughs> so today's winning numbers: nine, nine, and one. There's your dice back, sir. But I want to personally thank everybody who came along to the workshop. It was a lot of fun. Uh, I love teaching how to do spoon bending and water divining and all sorts of things. So thank you, everybody. And thank don't you. forget that next time you do a workshop, be sure to announce it on Skeptic Zone, and somebody may show up from having heard about it on the workshop, like today. That's true. <laughs>